A few years ago, I decided I needed a major life change. Everything seemed to be going downhill. My finances, my mental health, my life. I would go weeks without sleeping sometimes, as the heavy traffic passed through the city streets down below. Every time I went outside, I saw more homeless people, more needles and crack pipes littering the ground, more muggings and assaults and overdoses and deaths. The city had become a wasteland, and I knew it was time to leave. I had no girlfriend, no wife, no kids. My parents had both died a few years prior, and I barely talked to my siblings anymore. I had nothing to tie me down to this place where I felt like I was dying inside a little more each day. That was when I sold nearly everything I owned, got in my car, and drove up to Alaska to try starting anew. I bought a small cabin and a plot of land, in the middle of its majestic mountains and dark, enchanting forests. In the winter, the northern lights would shine through like the eyes of God, sending out divine trails of light that dance through the skies in cosmic waves. And while the move did help give me some peace of mind, in the end, the source of all my problems had ultimately followed me thousands of miles into this endless wilderness. It would take me a long time to realize the cause of all this misery was myself. Because, as a wise man once said, wherever I go, there I am. I lived in that cabin for three months without any major issues. I had a rifle and a shotgun for hunting, a small garden in the backyard, and a solar panel to generate electricity. This is the life. I said, relaxing on a hammock, I had strung across the corner of the cabin while staring at the endless beauty directly outside the window. White-capped mountains loomed like giants in front of thick clusters of evergreens. A virgin covering of fluffy snow made the entire world glisten and sparkle. There wasn't a house or road in sight. No work, no stress, no pollution, no cars honking all the time. I closed my eyes breathing in the clean air. I ended up falling asleep for a couple hours, waking up just as the sun had started setting. Bright orange streaks mixed with the bloody smears of the fading light as it disappeared behind the mountains. I groggily arose, stumbling over to make a cup of instant coffee. As I sipped it, I wandered around the room, looking for something to pass the time. There were still quite a few random objects left behind by the last owner that I hadn't gotten rid of yet. I had moved in to find a stocked bookshelf filled with classics by Philip K. Dick, Isaac Asimov, and Robert Heinlein. Bored, I started rifling through the collection looking for something good to pass the time. As I shuffled past a maze of death and ubik, something caught my eye. A black, leather-bound book with no title or author name stood there, its cover faded with time and wear. Curious, I pulled it out and opened it, I saw the cursive scrawled across the page in a neat, copperplate script, and realized it was a diary left behind by the previous owner. The first entry was dated January 9th, 
2015. This is what it said. I don't know if I'm going crazy or not. I went into town to talk with my therapist yesterday, and she said I should try writing everything down. She talks to me like it's all in my head, but I know it's not. When I first moved into the cabin, it seemed like paradise. I never thought in a million years that something would be slinking around at night. I never thought it would be hiding under my bed, peeking in windows and following me like a shadow. Right now, I'm snowed in with a cup of coffee in one hand and my pistol in the other. I can't sleep anymore. I keep hearing something shuffling around under the bed. Sometimes, I think I even hear ragged breathing. As if a corpse with dirt in its lungs had come back to life. I've caught glimpses of that thing in the darkness. Whatever it is, its skin is loose. Almost falling off the bone. It almost looks like a naked, emaciated man. Its eyes are rotted and dark. Its back hunched. Its spine twisted and jutting out like tumors. It moves in this slow, jerky way. But I can never seem to catch it. Its body seems broken and out of alignment. Its legs bend the wrong way sometimes. By the time I turn on the lights or try to take a video of it, it's always disappeared. But its fetid odor remains. It lingers in the cabin like a sweet-smelling spreading infection. I don't know what it wants from me. I want to leave. But with the storm raging outside, I'm stuck here, unable to get all the way back to town. The snow surrounds the cabin in mounds five feet high. I feel like a prisoner, caged with a rabid beast, not knowing when it will strike. My wife claims she hasn't seen or heard anything, but she keeps vanishing on me. Last night, she disappeared in the middle of a snowstorm. Where did she go? I asked her in the morning, but she said she was here the whole time. She didn't remember anything. There's no way she went into town. There wasn't time and the trails were impassable that far down. Something's going on here, but I don't know what it is. I'm truly scared for our lives. I slammed the diary shut. Not wanting to read any more. I didn't want to become infected by some kind of contagious cabin fever. If the last owner had gone insane in the mountains and started hallucinating naked corpses crawling around, I really didn't want to know. I shoved the diary back in the bookshelf, going for a maze of death instead. I tried to forget what I had read in the diary as I flew through the novella. All night, I tried to get the image of the naked, twisting man with rotting eyes out of my head, but I couldn't. I eventually fell asleep right before dawn, but as my eyes were closing, I thought I saw a silhouette in the window, a starved man with excited black eyes that seemed to be rotting out of his skull. I thought I saw him put his inhumanly long fingers against the glass as he leaned forward. I blinked, sitting up and glancing out into the white, snow-covered wonderland. There was nothing there. Another hunter occasionally followed the deer trails near my cabin. A frozen lake stood a quarter mile away, the surface white and covered in thick drifts of snow. I bundled up, deciding to go outside for a hike in the frigid dawn. 
I strapped on my snowshoes and grabbed my shotgun, as I always did when I went outside. I never knew when a polar bear might be waiting around the next tree after all. I opened the door, seeing footprints pressed into the snow all around my house. At first, I thought it was that silhouette I had seen, the nightmarish thing from the diary, but the footprints didn't go over to my window. They followed the trail 20 feet away, veering off towards the frozen lake at the bottom of the hill. I glanced down in that direction, seeing a black figure plodding slowly forward. Steve! I cried, recognizing my only neighbor in a four-mile radius. He had a cabin about a mile away, on his own little plot of land. He jumped, clearly startled by the sudden noise. His black snow pants and heavy fur coat swished together as he spun, raising his rifle high. When he saw me, he immediately lowered it and put a gloved hand up in a friendly greeting. Hey, Josh. Surprised to see you up this early. He yelled over the muted, wintry landscape. Sounds always seemed different after it snowed, as if all the noise in the world had become faded and dead. Yeah, I've been having a little trouble sleeping. I said, slinging my shotgun over my shoulder. What are you doing, anyway? Just a little hunting, you know. He said, giving me a sly wink. Animals are always most active around dusk and dawn, it seems. That's when I always have the best luck, anyway. He stepped close to me, staring me in the eyes. You do look like shit. Those bags under your eyes are big enough to carry groceries in. Yeah, trust me, I know. Hey, this might sound a little weird, but did you know the previous owner of this cabin? I asked. Steve's wrinkled, old face fell into a scowl. His expression immediately became guarded and distant. Sure. Sure, we met. He exclaimed bluntly. He seemed to be searching my face for something, but I didn't know what. His reaction left me feeling off balance and nervous. Is he still around? I said. Steve's scowl deepened. Buddy, I don't know what this is about. But he's dead. He's been dead. He died in that cabin, actually. He pointed a finger at my home accusingly. With those words, my heart seemed to drop into my stomach. Waves of dread flowed through my body like water. How... how did he die? Like a heart attack or something? I asked... Steve's gaze turned downwards. He didn't meet my eyes. Do you know that Alaska has the highest missing person rate in the entire United States? It's not even close. In fact, for the population size, we have far more people who go missing and never get found than anywhere else. They even have a name for it. The Alaska Triangle. And we're square in the middle of it. I stared blankly at him, wondering where he was going with this. It seemed like a way to avoid answering my question. No, I didn't know that. I responded. Steve nodded, raising his head again, and heaved a deep sigh. Look, the thing with the last owner and his wife, it's somewhat disturbing. If you really want to know, 
I'll tell you. But, it's certainly not going to help your peace of mind. And it definitely isn't going to help you get some sleep. I want to know. I insisted instantly. The wind started to whip past us. Flakes of ice and snow flew sideways in the sudden currents. Let's go back to your cabin then. Steve said, pulling his heavy fur-lined hood off and shaking out his long black hair behind him. I could use a bit of whiskey to warm up. We sat down with a bottle of Johnny Walker and two shot glasses. I wasn't much of a drinker, but Steve certainly was. He chugged three shots in the span of a minute. I sipped at mine, drinking half and putting it back down on the coffee table with a thunk. Steve grunted, hissing through his open mouth for a moment. Oof, that's the good stuff. He said, slamming his chest as the burning liquor worked its way down. Steve looked up at me with a new sparkle in his eyes. Huh. So, you want to know about what happened to Will Lenning? Well, I'll tell you that no one really knows the whole story. I used to see him occasionally. Come down and have a drink and talk. We all know each other around here, obviously. I nodded, motioning him on. He seemed like a normal upstanding guy. He kind of reminded me of you, actually. A young guy trying to escape the hustle and bustle of the city life. The cancer of the American dream. Well, he was here for maybe a couple months. I don't know. Everything seemed fine. We used to go skeet shooting occasionally. Have a beer, you know. We'd get together with a couple of other hunters, who live closer to town and sometimes play poker. I never saw anything odd about Will. I never could have predicted what happened to him. He heaved a long sigh at this, looking out the window at the sharp mountains with an expression of nostalgia. Well, what happened to him? I asked, encouraging him to go on. He started talking about seeing someone peering in through his window at night. He talked about hearing sounds from under his bed while he was laying there in the dark. Sounds like diseased breathing and shuffling. He started keeping all the lights on in his cabin 24 hours a day. Steve leaned close to me. A glimmer of fear rippled across his pale, wrinkled face. He started to lose his mind. Started digging holes all over the place looking for something. Even in the middle of snowstorms, I would occasionally see him outside digging. It seemed like he never slept anymore. It was classic cabin fever if I ever saw it. It was only a few weeks later that I came over here, concerned. I hadn't heard from him in a few days, which was fairly unusual. I found the door hanging wide open, propped up in a chair in the exact spot where you sit now. Will lay with a blast hole showing clear through his skull, a shotgun laying at his feet, and next to him, I found a blood-stained diary open to the middle page. The last entry was stained with blood spatter, but still visible. I remember leaning down and reading it. It was only a few sentences long. I glanced over at the bookshelf with the same diary, saying nothing. It said something like, I see what's going on now. The twisted man is leading me to the truth. Today, I will finally find it. And that was his last note. I asked, my heart hammering in my chest. He nodded. 
Yeah, I went into town and got some rangers to come check it out. Eventually, they got cops and CSI there. They took out all the stuff as evidence, including the diary. Good riddance, I say. Reading something like that is never beneficial. Sometimes delusions spread like a virus, you know what I mean? I did, but I said nothing. I glanced back at the diary. It's black, leather cover, gleaming like a crouching snake. And I wondered, if the police took the diary as evidence, how did it get back here? You said he had a wife living here with him too. Yeah, she went missing around the same time. Pretty bizarre. The cops thought maybe she just moved away, but... He shook his head grimly. As far as I know, she was never seen again. It was like she had evaporated into thin air. After Steve left, I walked stiffly over to the bookshelf taking down the diary. I flipped open through the pages. In the middle, I found the last entry. Spatters of old, darkened blood were scattered over the page like raindrops. I found the final note and read the date. January 27th. 2015. It read, Will Lenning had not lived long after he started seeing the twisted man. I wondered if my fate would be the same. The sun had started to set outside as I sat with the diary at the small circular kitchen table, eating some stewed venison and rice as I read through the entries. At the end, Will Lenning said the twisted man had been trying to guide him somewhere. That, in fact, the twisted man had been trying to protect him from some great evil, rather than being the source of it. I scoffed, feeling a flash of anger at his stupidity. His naivete obviously led him to his death. But then a flash of insight struck me like lightning. What if I was committing the same kind of stupidity? Perhaps I should just grab my gun and valuables and leave. I could take off on the snowmobile and be in town within a couple of hours. But in my heart, I knew I would not. Something about the mystery of all this beckoned me to stay. Like a siren leading sailors to destruction, my curiosity called out to me, and I knew I would not be leaving that night. I needed answers. And, sadly, I would find them. I had fallen asleep with an empty bottle of beer in my hand. I sat in front of the TV, which only got satellite reception. There were, of course, no cable or phone lines threading their way through the forest. All of my power came from stored solar energy. Since I rarely watch TV and really only used it to cook or heat up water for bathing, the energy produced was sufficient even in winter. Tonight, though, I needed its sound, its mindless flashing of lights and colors and canned laughter. It seemed to drive away the creeping, suffocating presence like a candle. I woke suddenly. The TV flashed with static. The repetitive hissing of white noise spit from the speakers like thousands of snakes. I glanced up at the clock. 3.33 a.m. I looked around the dark cabin, confused for a long moment. 
I didn't understand what had woken me so abruptly. The satellite had never gone out before either. Even in the howling winds and freezing hail of the Alaskan winter, the TV started flickering as if the static were rising upwards. Black lines traced their way horizontally across the screen. The hissing deepened into a gurgle. And for a second, I thought I heard faint words behind the white noise. I thought I heard breathing, slow and diseased, like the death gasps of a drowning man. A black line rose across the TV, and an image came into view. The cabin was suddenly plunged into silence, except for the shrieking, wintry wind outside. I leaned close to the screen, confused at what I was looking at. It looked like a live camera feed of a room. As I took in the details, I realized it was my cabin. I saw myself in the chair, leaning close to the screen. I raised my hand, and the miniature version of me on the screen did likewise. Ice water seemed to drip down my spine as waves of dread coursed through my body. What the hell is this? I whispered, looking back to where the camera should be. It was just a coarse wooden ceiling in that corner. I turned back to the screen and nearly screamed. The TV showed a pale, naked man, crouching directly behind my chair now. With jerky movements, he rose, his broken spine twisting and shivering. A hissing voice rang out from the speakers. It spoke as if it had dirt and writhing maggots in its throat. He is the killer, the shadow of death. It gurgled. Many have fallen. Many lie buried across this forest. You will be next. He is watching you. Long, broken fingers with blackened nails reached out to touch my shoulder. I jumped out of my chair, stumbling back as I spun around in terror. My back smashed into the TV and it fell to the floor with a shattering of glass and explosion of light. In those few moments before the darkness descended on me like a blanket, I thought I glimpsed a pale, sunken face with rotted, blackened eyes peeking out from behind the chair. I turned on every light in the cabin, but there was no sign of the twisted man now. I knew I had to get out of there, though. I thought about the warning that the voice had spoken. If the creature wanted to attack me, then why hadn't it just killed me while I was sleeping? None of it made sense. Who was watching me? The twisted man? And if he was, why warn me? Perhaps it was psychological warfare, I thought to myself. Perhaps the twisted man simply liked to play with his food before he ate it. Thoughts raced through my head at a thousand miles an hour as I threw on snow pants and a couple heavy sweaters and coats. I covered up my entire body as much as I could to try to prevent frostbite. I had made up my mind to flee. There was no snowstorm tonight, though the entire landscape was blanketed in it, and I knew the wind chill would be like an ice blade whipping against my skin. It was extremely dangerous to travel in the middle of the night like this, in temperatures that might reach negative 30 degrees. Steve had been right, after all. 
Alaska had the highest missing person rate of any state, and many of them were never found. Their bodies, likely frozen solid in the deep snow, dozens of miles from the nearest town. I grabbed my shotgun, jumped on my snowmobile, and started heading to Steve's cabin. I hoped I could wait there until sunrise, and then figure out what to do next. But fate would take the decision out of my hands. I felt like there were eyes watching me as I drove along the narrow, winding deer trail. The boughs of the evergreens reached into the path like greedy hands, grabbing at my coat and legs. More than a couple times, I thought I saw a pale, naked figure standing in the snow, but it had always gone when I turned to look. I gave a sigh of relief when Steve's place appeared in the distance. I could see the lights twinkling through the small windows of his log cabin. I pulled up next to his door. Looking down, I saw two pairs of footprints there, one much smaller than the other. I found it odd, but shrugged it off. The snowmobile cut off with a sucking gurgle. I knocked on the door hard a few times. Steve appeared after a few moments, groggy and half-dressed. He blinked slowly as he looked me up and down. His wrinkled face fell into a frown. Steve, I need a favor. Something weird is happening in my cabin. Can I stay here until morning? Until maybe I can go into town or something? I can't stay at my place tonight. I just can't. He nodded, yawning and motioning me in. You can sleep on the couch, I guess. Put that shotgun somewhere safe, though, boy. He had a partitioned bedroom in his cabin. It was significantly larger than my little one-room cabin, though it was basically still just a joint kitchen living room, a small bedroom and a bathroom. He pointed to a well-worn couch in the corner and gave me an apathetic wave as he stumbled back into his bedroom, slamming the door. I couldn't sleep, though. I tiptoed around the room, looking at Steve's bookshelf. He had a rather strange taste in books. Lots of Anne Rule and true crime there. I saw dozens of books about Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Richard Chase, Herbert Mullen, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Richard Ramirez among the collection. At the end... A large, black binder stood, unlabeled and worn-looking. It reminded me of the look of that leather-bound diary for a second, and my heart dropped. But logically, I knew this was just a coincidence. Yet, still, I pulled out the binder. My curiosity peaked. What I found inside filled me with dread and horror. Countless news clippings covered the length of it. The first clipping was from nearly 20 years earlier, about a woman who went missing in the Alaskan forest while hiking. A later one confirmed that her body was never found, and that her family was still hoping she might turn up alive somewhere. A reward was offered for any information, it said. And every page after that was more of the same. Missing women, murdered prostitute, missing man, no leads. I kept flipping through until I found clippings about Will Lenning's death and the sudden disappearance of his wife. 
On the article, Steve had used red marker to scrawl HA HA next to it. I heard the click of a gun being cocked from behind me. I froze as Steve's voice traveled across the room like a whisper. How do you like my work, friend? He asked, his tone jovial and mocking. I still held the binder of horrors tightly in my hands as I stared open-mouthed at this man I thought I knew. It's you? What? You killed Will Lenning and his wife and a lot of other women, apparently. Everything felt unreal. As if I were stuck in a dream. Steve's grin spread across his face. But his blue eyes stayed cold and dead. Yes. Well, she was cheating on him with me anyway. Just another whore, you know. They always get what's coming to them in the end. He hissed with hatred oozing from his voice. It's too bad, really. I just killed another one tonight. I was planning on saving you for later. The urge isn't too bad yet right now, after all. It comes in cycles, you see. It comes in waves. I saw a glimmer of pale, naked flesh writhing behind Steve. With jerky movements, the twisted man came up behind him. I said nothing, just watching with wide-eyed horror and amazement. You need help, man. I whispered. Steve laughed. Help. The only help they give people like me is a needle in the arm. You know that. That's why it's important to always cover your tracks. The twisted man ran a long, broken finger across Steve's neck. Steve gave a strangled cry and jumped. He spun around, screaming. I glanced over at my shotgun next to the couch. I jumped for it as Steve turned back to me, firing his pistol twice. The first bullet soared high above me, raining wood splinters down on my head. But the second ripped into my leg. A cold, burning pain ran like fire up my shin. I screamed in agony and battle fury as I gripped the shotgun, spinning and firing. Steve's head exploded as the slug ripped through his brain. His forehead collapsed like a smashed melon as bone splinters and blood sprayed the wall behind him. The twisted man stood there, hunched over, grinning up at me. I felt warm blood gushing from my leg as I stared back at him, breathing hard. I wondered if I was dying. You... you weren't after me at all, were you? I asked... You were after... Steve? But the twisted man said nothing. After a long moment, he slinked back into the shadows of the bedroom and disappeared. As night crawled its way towards morning, I thought back to the words the twisted man had spoken through the TV, suddenly understanding everything. He is a killer. The shadow of death. Many have fallen. Many lay buried across this forest. You will be next. He is watching you. He hadn't been trying to hurt me at all. He had been trying to warn me. He had probably tried to warn Will Lenning and his wife, too. I wrapped my leg in gauze, gritting my teeth. The wound 
looked puckered and deep, but I could still move my foot, and the bullet had gone clean through the flesh. I poured alcohol on it, screaming in pain as it burned its way through my flesh. After rummaging through Steve's bedroom, I found some prescription painkillers and swallowed a handful of them with a beer. I knew I would need the opiate high to get through the pain of riding into town with a mutilated leg. As the sun finally rose, I made my way outside the blood-stained floors of the cabin to my snowmobile. Before I left, I glanced back at that horrid place, the scene of so much torment and death. In the open doorway, the twisted man stood, his back hunched, his rotted lips grinning at me, his hand lifted into the air with jerky movements and waved. I waved back as I started the engine and headed into town.